Hi, I'm Amit Denny from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press and Genome Research. Last week, we had the 85th Cold Spring Harbor Symposium, and the topic this year was biological timekeeping. Joining me today is John Hoganesh from Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center in Ohio, the, the United States. Thanks for being here and welcome back to Cold Spring Harbor in Cyberspace. You're welcome, I'm glad to be here. So before we talk about research, I'd like to briefly ask you about your background, where you're from, what your path has been to becoming a scientist working on the circadian biology. Yeah, um, so I was born in the Netherlands but my family moved to America when I was probably four years old. And so I grew up in Gainesville, Florida, um, which is home of the Fighting Gators, but also Tom Petty, Stephen Stills, two members of the Eagles. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great, great city to grow up in. And then I went on to Northwestern University where my first year in graduate school, I took a class from Joe Takahashi, who's uh, obviously a, a, a real legend in the clock field. And he explained about a lot of different topics, but one of them was obviously the work of the, the work of uh, uh, Seymour Benzer and Ron Kanopka and the identification of the PER gene. And from that kind of, of uh, from that time point forward, I got really interested in clocks. And I ended up um, doing my PhD with Chris Bradfield and um, ended up identifying a whole bunch of transcription factors. And they ended up being BMAL1, BMAL2, NPOS2, also HIF1, HIF2, HIF3. They ended up being uh, critical components of the circadian clock and the hypo hypoxia system. And so from there, I went on to industry, actually, to Novartis um, in, the, in their San Diego unit. I worked there for about six years. And then I moved back east, eventually ended up at Penn for 10 years and ended up in Cincinnati about five years ago, more or less just, uh, just following my family across the country. Everybody has a different story. That's right. Um, so in the meeting, you talked about primarily machine learning approaches to finding sleep genes. Right. Um, for those who may have missed your talk, could you please give us the brief summary? Yeah, so I got first interested in this idea um, roughly, roughly 10 years ago, and about maybe four or five years ago, we got kind of interested in taking the Netflix approach. So everybody is familiar with, with Netflix or with uh, Amazon Prime. And so they're, in, they're interested in retaining customers. Um, so at the time, um, they would ask you what kind of movies do you like, or simply watch your behavior about what you turn on. And they held a competition in the, 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 prize was $1 million. And it was won by these scientists at Carnegie Mellon University, these computer scientists. Um, and, and the idea was simple. If, if, you, if, you like, if you like zombie movies, chances are good you might like werewolf movies. So they were simply looking at the behavior of, of what movies people looked at. Um, they would then go to the information about that, the subject, the director, the actors in the movies, um, all these types of metadata that surrounded each, each movie or each TV show that people watched. And then they would look for um, li likely other movies, other, other TV shows that people were, were, um, were bound to like. And so we had the idea first for clock genes a few years ago and, and more recently for sleep genes to, uh, to take the same approach. And so in my talk, I go over our efforts to first identify all sleep genes. There's no sleep gene database. So we had to spend um, about you know four or five months combing the literature um, to look for all known sleep genes. And we took that list of all known sleep genes and we actually built a genetic test that's since been validated um, for, those, for those sleep genes. So the, the, one of the outputs of this work is we now, we now have a, a clinically available um, sleep gene panel, the first of its kind, um, that can be used to diagnose patients with particular sleep disorders, not just circadian disorders, but it also could be insomnia. It, it could be, it could be a restless sleep, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, but in addition to developing a genetic test, I wanted to, to turn back to this Netflix approach. And so we, we took the, 
we took the, the different data sets that were used to drive the, the sleep gene discovery. And this included things like, um, were, they, were they a known sleep gene? So you, you have a training set and then you have a, a test set. And so we applied um, you know, five different machine learning methods and figured out which method was the best for both uh, recall of previously known sleep genes and also being able to nominate potentially new sleep genes. And then in, in, in my lab, or I, I would say in all good geno genetics, genomics labs, you wanna make sure you validate some of your, of your novel hits. So we went back and did the mouse genetics and showed that, um, that the NF-kappa B pathway well, uh, regulated, regulated sleep. And so that's more or less, more or less my talk. Um, so during the talk you mentioned, and you just also mentioned about uh, validating some of these genes, and you did use uh, UK Biobank to do some of that, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, could you, could this become a circular theme where you actually use that information and go back and probe the Biobank data to expand this panel and gain further insights? Absolutely. I'd be a little bit worried about what tier we would put the UK Biobank panel genes in, because it gives you a, gen a gen genomic interval. It gives you the, these coordinates on the genome, but it's by no means does it point you at the exact gene. Um, and so that would make it hard to, hard to report back to a patient or to a provider. We, we, we kind of need to know the, the gene and actually um, not just the gene, but the, but the allele, the mutation, the actual mutation that's in the gene and, and have some, some sense of what that mutation does to, to sleep or circadian rhythms for, us to be, for it to be reportable. But certainly um, it, would, it would be possible to, to nominate variants of unknown function keep those separately. Yep. And once, once you see like the same variant in the same gene in several patients with the same, with the same problem, it becomes very likely that that, that is a, a variant that's contributing to a sleep, a sleep disorder. And that would become unknown function to known function with experimental validation, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. A virtuous cycle. Yes. Well, actually I have to say during the meeting and in your talk, as well, I was struck by how only a small percentage of therapies are paying attention to time of day. Um, I mean, it looks like the circadian medicine is a wide open field. Um, I would say yes and no. Um, I had an unfortunate hospital stay this spring myself. Um, and uh, on my exit sheet, uh, I, I received instructions to take a variety of medications and it said when, when I should take them after waking um, in the morning, uh, in the evening or before bed. So I think it's starting to, it's, and I actually looked up all of the recommendations that were made for the, for the medications and all but two were correct. Um, so they, uh, I think it's starting to, I think it's starting to be taken into consideration for short acting medications. Um, and there, and I think it also points to how are we going to roll this out. Um, I think it'll be relatively straightforward to roll this out in, in a hospital setting. We have the control over when we give the drugs, but we could also use these exit sheets. These uh, on your way out of the hospital, you get a sheet that says you take this medication after waking up or before you go to sleep. I know it's quite difficult in the, let's say, in the natural habitat of humans as well, but. Uh, is it possible to use in this day and age, perhaps uh, some sort of uh, smartphone app that might uh, benefit out of the hospital recording? Yeah, it wouldn't take. Um, it wouldn't take anything. Remind me to take my beta blocker at six p.m. Done. Done. And then if you take it. You can say that, and then maybe it can be used as a feedback. Yeah, absolutely. all these things are now currently doable. Now there's a lot of wrinkles wrinkles in it. Like you probably don't want to have to do it through your uh, automated iPhone option. Um, maybe you'd like a designated app to do something like that, or maybe you do want to do it through the iPhone since it's so simple. Hmm. And will you can even set it up to be a daily reminder or however you want to do it. Uh, so you mentioned I think around 120 studies that looked at time of day effects. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it was around seven to five percent where actually it was a positive, meaning there That's was right. time of the effect. And if I remember correctly, the overall percentage of trials that take time of day into consideration is way below 1%. Was that? Way below, way below. So why aren't more trials including time of day as a variable? I, I'm curious what the main obstacle is. I think it's uh, really intentionally setting out to do it would, would really to test both times to test. People are, are most compliant or adherent to taking things after they wake up or before they go to bed. It turns out if you ask somebody to take something at 2 p.m., it's very unlikely they would take it at 2 p.m. So they're most adherent to protocol um, at those two time points. And my guess is even though uh, a small uh, phase two study would, would really cost very little in the grand scheme of things, that the fact that they would have to have another group in their drug development pipeline um, doubling the doubling the the size of the test group from AM to PM or from after waking to before bed is the cost that scares people from doing it. Um, but as I think we've pointed out in a, several publications so far now, that um, if if your drug has a half life of less than eight hours, which is which is half of all drugs, then um, it's very likely that it could benefit from 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 uh, from dosage time, and it behooves the pharmaceutical sector, including academic medicine, to begin to take into account time of administration. So you're saying that human behavior is more of an issue than uh, other biology, branches of biology taking circadian into consideration? It's human behavior, and it's also the, the bean counters who want to keep the the trial costs, even for relatively small phase phase uh, two studies, phase two A studies, low. Mm -hmm. um, they worry about they worry about the cost so much, and they're not thinking about the potential benefit of finding your your drug works better. Maybe maybe it doesn't beat your competitor's drug at at morning administration, but it does when you do evening administration. So those are the kind that the, the kind of imagination in the clinical world is is really where our community needs to needs to have needs to have some um, better penetration. I was, you know, I was thinking about the coronavirus epidemic, and right when um, right when it happened, I, I emailed several experts in the field, including the Oxford Group, about about the the studies of the influenza virus, and there's a there's a a bunch of literature now that if you give if you give the vaccine um, after waking, that the the uh, the amount of antibodies that are produced is higher than if you give it later in the afternoon. Hmm. Um, but to my knowledge, no one has tried that for the coronavirus yet. I think there was just such a we have to get something in the clinic. Let's not we'll mess with time of day later. But I, I try I've at least tried to get people thinking about it. Hmm. That is interesting. And probably a similar case is true for other aspects of the infections as well. Right. The idea is that you're, you, while you're sleeping, you don't really confront um, dangerous things like bacteria and viruses because you're more or less in a sedentary state. And maybe your immune system is revved up um, to respond to challenges after you wake. You wake up, you get up, you go hunt for your food or Go to your go to your uh, pantry and, and make your breakfast. That's when your immune system is really revved up to fight. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I remember seeing a poster from the Martinson group talking about how uh, daylight savings might have some relevance to infection rates. And you also mentioned that uh, when you looked at processes, seemingly unrelated processes, to look for new sleep genes, I think infection was one That's of great. the. That's great. Yeah, we turned the the Netflix problem on its head. And instead of asking what are likely to be sleep and, and circadian regulators, we asked for what data sets were best able to segregate sleep and circadian genes from all the other genes in the genome. And some of those data sets had to do with bacterial and viral infection. And has almost everybody on the planet has been sick with a viral or bacterial infection before. And as you probably known from your own experience, one of the things that can happen is you become tired you get lethargic and you want to sleep more. Um, so it, it makes a lot of sense 
um, from, from that perspective. Hmm. So, so the chrono approach, you allowed you to identify a number of clock genes. And you mentioned how computational approaches can be used to find most sleeping, sleep related genes in unrelated data sets. So when you showed some gene names, I you know, recognized some of them inevitably, including a major quiescent neural stem cell marker, uh, which is what I used to work on. And it makes me wonder what processes may be under circadian control that we don't know. Of. Uh, right. My question to you is, can chrono-like approaches be used to identify circadian related biological processes or perhaps disorders and finally, you know, therapies? I think so. Um, I wouldn't say that the machine learning approach is the, is the only way that that can be done. Um, uh, but we've, we've done large scale, both, both studies in mice and in people now, even in thousands of people where we've uh, used different methods to actually um, to actually find where in the circadian cycle a sample is from. And we've built a, an atlas now of 13 human tissues where we can look at, uh, at, at each, each sample is now a single sample from a single person uh, across uh, hundreds to thousands of, of samples. And we built a map of all these processes in both humans and mice. And we found, we've mapped all those back to drug targets, mapped those drug targets back to drugs that have short half-lives. And we're in the process of validating some of those results now, um, both in, in uh, preclinical models um, and also in, in, in clinical studies. That's very cool. Um, I'd like to go back to your talk, a specific example for a minute. I, uh, when you were using the genetic test that you developed for sleep and circadian associated polymorphisms, uh, I think you gave an interesting example of a young girl who actually had a reverse clock. So as a night owl myself, I was just curious what the uh, population looks like in terms of you know, having a, what's so-called a normal clock versus say night owls and a reverse clock. What does the distribution look like? Do you have some insights into that? Uh, really Till, Till Ronenberg and his colleagues are the best people to sort of ask those questions about. Um, something like 9% of all adolescents while they're developing will become DSPS, delayed sleep phase syndrome. Um, so it's a very common and developmental um, process. And most of those adolescents will, will outgrow it and eventually they'll, they'll sleep more quote unquote normal hours. But as Till and his colleagues point out, um, that um, there's plenty of there's plenty of of advanced sleep phase syndrome people that walk around there. It's not a disease because it's a it's a, just a human variation. There's plenty of delayed sleep phase syndrome people, and one of the things we we caution our patients with those genetic predilections is, look, we realize you have to go to school now, and they're they're not going to change the the start of high school just for you. And so we can help you for a few years get through this particular difficult time. Um, but eventually you may take your, your genetic predilection for being a, a night person and, and work the Tokyo desk in, in, the, in the New York Times or the New York Stock Exchange. It doesn't have to be a negative. You can gravitate towards jobs that fit your, fit your lifestyle. Bartenders tend to want to be up later. Uh, People that deliver the paper it would be very hard to be a paper delivery person if if you were a night owl. Yes. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it just, yeah, and actually, we even took our residency class uh, this last year and put a, a Fitbit essentially on them and um, have begun to study a chronotype in 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 medical care because right we we run a hospital we run twenty four seven three sixty five. And we need to have people at all times of the day. Makes sense to have the night owls working at night and the morning larks working in the morning. Would be more efficient. Uh, just going back to this, the 120 studies where the time of day was analyzed. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether this uh, individual was included in that study. The, this uh, this uh, young girl, with the reverse cycle, no. No, these, these were all clinical studies that were done mainly in academic medical centers 
looking at timing of medication. Okay. And so she's a, she was, she's only currently, I think she's 16 now, but um, she wasn't involved in any of those. Okay. So, uh, but there were like, to your point, there were patients in those studies that got the, the instruction to, to take the morning, to take their drug at eight o'clock in the morning or at 4 PM at night. Mm -hmm. And even though it said eight o'clock on the wall, it didn't mean that their bodies eight o'clock. Exactly. That's the question that, that I was trying to get at. Right. Uh, is the, um, so for example, if this individual was in this study, first of all, just a basic question, would she have recorded as positive? Meaning, would she be an outlier in one way or in one direction or the other? Not necessarily outlier, but would My she be? My guess is she would be a non-adherent to protocol. So if we told her to take something at eight o'clock in the morning, she would be um, very likely asleep and unable to comply. And so when she had her log and she had to write down when she did things, instead of it being at eight o'clock, it would, she would be taking it more at like two o'clock or four o'clock in the afternoon. Hmm. So actually, I, I guess my, the question that I was trying to get at is, what, so in these studies, not much is known about the personal biological clocks of these people. That's right. But it sounds like if you actually had some information you could use that to really clean that data up and that 75% might even be higher than 75%. Would that be That's a right. The first and easiest thing to do would be to tie things instead of to the time on the wall, we could tell them to tie it to their sleep wake cycle. So instead of saying, take it at eight o'clock in the morning, take it uh, within 30 minutes of waking up. And I think that would be the first and most obvious step. The second thing we can do is do sleep logs and begin to figure out what phase of the circadian oscillator they're in. That can be done. It can also be done biomedically with blood samples or skin samples. We can phase people with either of those. And there are surveys like you can give a questionnaire and begin to understand a little bit about whether or not a person is a, is a morning type or an afternoon type or an evening type. That, that kind of, all that can be learned but the simplest and easiest thing to do would be to change the recommendations from take in the morning and take in, before, uh, take in the evening to after waking and before bed. That's something we can do today. Yeah. Um, so just in the big picture of things, wh where do you see the next step in the computational biology's role in the circadian field? Is there a breakthrough we're waiting for? Is it more about uh, organizing, sharing of more data? What is it? I mean, I would really love it if people would write down the time when they do things in, in the, both in the hospital where they do log time for procedures and for medication timing. But I would, I would love it if, uh, if genomic data sets were, were similarly annotated. Hmm. So we had the time of sample collection. We had um, the information with respect to the patient's sleep cycle, that would really be helpful. Right now, we're limited to roughly a few dozen or a few hundred data sets where we have time written down. Um, there's, there's, there's over 2 million data sets that are now in GEO. Um, so the vast, vast majority have no annotation with respect to time when something was collected. And so that, that leaves it um, not completely useless because we can retroactively um, figure out the time where things were taken, but it, it, it needs to be under specific circumstances. We need to have at least 200 samples. We need to have good coverage of the wall clock. We can't just have all of our samples collected in this section of it. We need samples taken from the 24 hour cycle. So there are, there are complications to these computational solutions. And whereas simply writing down when you took a sample would solve many of these problems. Actually, uh... The evolutionary biologist uh, Dobzhansky said, it's a, one of my favorite scientific quotes, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Right. So, uh, it looks like, you know, if things head the right way, we're going towards a future where a lot of things in medicine is going to make a lot better sense if you're taking the circadian cycles into consideration. I mean, half of all your genes oscillate somewhere in your body, half. Um, so when we've looked at sources of variation or sources of error in human or mouse data, the clock is always near the top. Um, so we know that it's an incredibly important process and yet most people 
take it for granted that uh, the drug is going to work for them and that when they take it doesn't doesn't really matter. That's just not true. On that note, probably we should end in the interest of uh, time, seeing the Perfect. clock behind you. Yep. John, it's been a pleasure talking to you and thank you very much. Same to you. Next time I'm, I'm local, I'll come say hi. Sounds great. See you in the next meeting. Ciao, ciao. All right. Bye. Thank you.